Hello and welcome to my web presentation for World Literature. I will be discussing the French writer Michel Liquet de Montaigne, who was the inventor of the essay as we know it. Over the course of this video, I'm going to be discussing his life, the hectic world of France in the 1500s, his legacy, and then I'll be taking a closer look at three of his works, of the inconsistency of our actions, of cannibals, and of friendship. Let's get started. Michel de Montaigne was born in 1533 to Pierre Kem and Antoinette de Lue at the Chateau de Montaigne in Bordeaux, France. They were a family of wine merchants and were able to become nobility from their financial success. His father was active in trade as a member of the Court of Assistance of Perigueux and as mayor of Bordeaux. In 1557, Montaigne would begin to serve as a magistrate for the Chambon Gets in Bordeaux, France. It is during this time that he meets Etienne de la Boetti, who would become his closest friend and perhaps the most influential person in his life, aside from his father, to the point where it's actually quite impossible to discuss Montaigne without discussing la Boetti. Montaigne and la Boetti became fast companions and entered into an intense friendship. Unfortunately, they only enjoyed a few years together until la Boetti's death of a fever in 1563. The loss of his dearest friend was a severe blow to Montaigne, and he fell into a deep depression. Unfortunately, in 1568, another emotional blow came when Montaigne's father passed away. He inherited his father's title and estate, and he became so emotionally attached to the estate that he would begin signing his name not as Michel de Kim, but as Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne decided to retire from his political career in 1571 so that he might manage his estate better. On the walls of his library, he wrote a Latin inscription to commemorate the occasion, which is a statement saying he will retire to the bosom of the learned virgins, where in calm and freedom from all cares he will spend what little remains of his life, so it may be spent in freedom, tranquility, and leisure. However, in 1981, he is called back to Bordeaux during travels to Italy so that he could serve as mayor, much like his father was and then he returned to his state after two terms in 1585. During his retirement, Montaigne was still mourning the loss of Le Boite. In order to better cope with his depression, he turned to writing. Not only did Montaigne decide to detail what his friendship with Le Boite was like, but he began to tackle other topics such as the world around him. Montaigne had no end of material to write about. France is always having a revolution or a war. In this case, it was the French Wars of Religion, fought between the Huguenots and the Catholics. During his lifetime, there were nine wars of religion. At the center of the conflict, however, it wasn't just about the religious struggles with the Huguenots and the Catholics. The debates concerning secession for the French throne symbolized strains in the nobility and amongst the people. Many brutal events happened during the wars of religion, one of the more famous examples being the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in Paris, when thousands of Protestants were murdered in a fit of anti-Protestant clamor. Montaigne was a supporter of Henry de Navarre, who was the leader of the Huguenots, and the two often sent correspondence to each other. His opinions were trusted to the point of being a mediator in the negotiations between the Protestants and the Catholics. When Henry de Navarre became King Henry IV and converted to Catholicism, Montaigne wrote to congratulate him. So, yes, with all this going on, there was no end to the material. And what exactly was Montaigne writing about? Well, his book is divided into various chapters, all of which are different subjects. They have titles like of anger, of drunkenness, and of the power of the imagination, and so forth. Now, the title doesn't necessarily mean that's what the chapter will be about. Of cannibals, which will be discussed in detail in a bit, isn't 100% about cannibalism. Montaigne does link the material to it, but in his own fashion. The writing style is something like an extended commonplace book. Montaigne writes his subjects freely and doesn't concern himself with the overly fanciful prose, although his natural writing style is quite lovely, and it's easy to find multiple pearls of wisdom throughout his book, as you can see by all these little flags. <laughs> when he's writing, Montaigne inserts quotations from various writers and philosophers to support his words, or he writes around them. A few of these writers are... Plutarch, Seneca, Horace, Homer, Ovid, Virgil, Lucretius, Cato, and so forth. 
In regards to abusive quotations, which comes from one of his chapters on physiology, he says, As someone might say about me that all of them here is put together a heap of foreign flowers, and that the only thing of my own that I've added is the thread to bind them with. In doing this, Montaigne did not intentionally set out to write what we call an essay, although the modern reader will identify his work as such. That is because Montaigne penned the term. In French, the word essay means to attempt. That's what Montaigne called his work, his attempts. So the title of his book, Essays, can translate to attempts. I'm sure English majors, when strapped for time and trying to make sense of assignments, can surely understand what it means to turn in attempts to our professors. Of the inconsistency of our actions is a really great way of easing yourself into Montaigne's writing style, especially because he straight up says that one of his favorite things is inconstant people. He loves to contradict himself. And the first time I went through these essays, it was actually a little frustrating that he never seemed to make up his mind on some things. But that's actually one of the beauties of Montaigne, is that it's a very natural thought process. I mean, who doesn't change their mind at some point? And the writing of these essays took the course of years from the 1570s to the 1580s, and he continued to edit them throughout his life. And so he begins his essay by saying, Those who make a practice of comparing human actions are never so perplexed as when they try to see them as a whole and in the same light, for they commonly contradict each other so strangely that it seems impossible that they have come from the same shop. He also goes on to say that it has often seemed to me that even good authors are wrong to insist on fashioning a consistent and solid fabric out of us because that's simply impossible, as he'll go on to say, is that mankind is never constant, that we're always changing and shifting, and our ideals, our opinions, they can be one thing one day and the next another. I mean, for example, I was a Republican in high school. And that's part of what the essays are attempting to do, are they're attempting to document his changes in minds and his opinions from one day to the next. And they're very honest opinions because he didn't quite expect that his essays would be put out to a larger audience. So in a way, it's almost like personal writing, diary writing, just a little bit more formal. To close up the piece, he says, In view of this, a sound intellect will refuse to judge men simply by their outward actions. We must probe the inside and discover what spring sets men in motion. But since this is an arduous and hazardous undertaking, I wish fewer people would meddle with it. It's actually really amazing that even though he went through his essays multiple times in order to correct things and make additions, he didn't want to clear up these inconsistencies. He wanted to present himself as he really was, which is not something a lot of writers are willing to do. Of Cannibals is a really great essay to look at in terms of when Montaigne would title an essay something and would begin to write about that subject, but would eventually move on to something entirely different, but he would link to it. Considering the attitudes that most Europeans had towards the New World natives, it wasn't exactly very positive, very friendly. They were viewed as savages, as barbarians, and that uh, they needed Christianity to civilize them. Now, Montaigne doesn't necessarily go down that road. He actually has a bit of respect, and he is actually rather interested by the natives. He describes them with a sense of wonder by saying that their days are spent in dancing and that they're recommended to have only two things, valor against their enemy and to have love for their wives. Uh, then he gets to the bit on cannibalism. When they bring back a prisoner from one of their battle victories, then they take that person, they tear them apart, and then they feast on their flesh. One would immediately expect that his wonder of the natives would then go downhill, that he would continue to condemn them. However, his essay shifts onto a new subject, 
He says, I am not sorry that we noticed the barbarous horror of such acts, but I am heartily sorry that, judging their faults rightly, we should be so blind to our own. And in this, he begins to call out France for the horrible acts of violence that they are inflicting upon their countrymen. He says that although French do not eat the flesh of their countrymen, that the French have surpassed them in every kind of barbarity, because this is occurring to men who are alive, not men who have been killed and then feasted upon. The passage that is really the major focus of this essay is whenever he's detailing the trip that three native men take to France, and then they're asked to describe what it is they see. He says that, and in a very montane moment, he says, they say three things, but he can only remember two of them. He says that they really don't understand why it is that strong, bearded men stand around a child king and ask him to lead the country. Why don't they just kill the child and then one of them take his place? It just seems natural to them. And second, that they notice there were among us men full and gorged with all sorts of good things and that their other halves were beggars at their doors, emaciated with hunger and poverty, and they thought it strange that these needy halves could endure such an injustice, and did not take the others by the throat, or set fire to their houses. Now that is a really bold statement to make on Montaigne's part, and he's not afraid to make it. He is not patient whatsoever with religious extremism. He won't stand for it. He says that it's cruel, it's harmful, and it's tearing the country apart. And if the natives can see that, and even though they eat people, they're more human than we are. Montaigne's most famous and probably most renowned essay would be A Friendship, and for good reason. It's really because of this essay, which deals with the loss of the Boite, that the rest of the essays even really exist. This is Montaigne at his most personal and most raw, because in discussing friendship and what it means to him, he's essentially discussing La Boite and how important he was to him in his life, even if they only spent a few years together. It makes sense that all his ideas on friendship have been shaped by him. Montaigne then goes on to describe what he believes other people think of friendship as, and that they're wrong if they believe that their father or their brother are their best friend. He says that family members can't be your best friend. If your best friend, if you would, you know, call it that, is your parent, it's only because you want their respect. It's not possible if they birthed you. Friendship can only occur whenever you choose someone, not someone who's related to you. He also goes on to say that love for a woman cannot be the same. Because, obviously, women just don't have that emotional depth that men do. Women can't comprehend the type of soul-binding experience that friendship is. It's impossible, obviously. And almost as if he can hear the sound of academics typing away furiously at whether or not him and Lavoite's friendship was actually sexual, he then goes on to describe that Friendship cannot be that other licentious Greek love, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. And that sort of relationship, he feels that it's based on physical qualities, and there's not an emotional connection that can be made there. Now, the most beautiful statements that Montaigne makes are actually a rather short summary of him saying that he can't really express himself fully, whether or not he would like to or not. And it reads, For the rest, what we ordinarily call friends and friendships are nothing but acquaintances, and familiarity formed by some chance or convenience, by means of which our souls are bound to each other. In the friendship I speak of, our souls mingle and blend with each other so completely that they face the themes that join them and cannot find it again. If you press me to tell me why I loved him, I feel this cannot be expressed, except by answering, 
because it is he, because it is I. And that's actually a rather extraordinarily beautiful statement because it makes Montaigne say that true friendship, actual friendship, is a blending of the souls, that you become one person, and that you're almost soulmates without being romantic with each other. He sees himself in Le Boite, and possibly that Le Boite sees himself in Montaigne, and that the reason the essays didn't exist whenever Le Boite was alive was because there was no reason to. He had his other person with him. He was a complete person. A truly personal part of the essay begins whenever Montaigne starts to incorporate more quotes into the piece. And I believe that it's because he feels it's getting a little too personal, that it's getting harder for him to write. And that's because he's detailing what he feels once Le Borte is no longer in his life. He says that, for in truth, if I compare all the rest of my life, but by the grace of God, I have spent it pleasantly, comfortably, and except for the loss of such a friend, free from any grievous affliction, and full of tranquility of mind, having accepted my natural and original advantages without seeking other ones. If I compared it all, I say, that the four years which were granted me to enjoy the sweet company and society of that man, there's nothing but smoke, nothing but dark and dreary night. He continues on to say, I only drag on a weary life, and the very pleasures that come my way, instead of consoling me, redouble my grief for his loss. We went tabs in everything. It seems to me that I am robbing him of his share. He quotes Terence in saying, Nor may I rightly taste his pleasures here alone, so I resolved when he who shared my life is gone. Which goes right back to believing that Le Boite was practically his soulmate in life, and that without him, he's only half a person. He can't exist fully without him. And his last really personal statement of the essay is, there is no action or thought in which I do not miss him, as indeed he would have missed me. For just as he surpassed me infinitely in other ability and virtue, so did he in duty of friendship. And after that, he gives two more quotes from Horace and Catalyst about the nature of friendship, and then he tries to describe Le Boite when he was a youth of 16. It's as if he can't really continue to go on to describe what friendship meant to him, because it's too painful. I mean, you have to keep in mind that Montaigne was incredibly depressed after his loss, and it's very easy to imagine him actually hurting when writing this essay. And it's rather incredible that he's able to say it so eloquently, or even at all. And in this essay, I feel that it's really Montaigne's true spirit at work. He can write something like Of Cannibals, which is a great look at the historical views of the day and what's going on in France. But this is really who Montaigne is. This is where Montaigne really shines through. He's not afraid to be so personal with himself and with his audience, and that he wants so badly to record these feelings that he's willing to push through the pain of Le Boite's loss, and he's able to do it very eloquently. The reason Montaigne can be so popular with his readers is that there's really something for everybody. I mean, Really, there's so many on so many various different subjects that it's easy to find yourself in his words. A lot of writers tend to love his work, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, it seemed as if I had myself written the book in some former life. What you can take away from Montaigne is very best summarized by Gustave Lebert. He says, don't read him as children do, for amusement nor as the ambitious do, to be instructed. No, read him in order to live. 
which gets right down to that Renaissance question of how to live, which is coincidentally the theme of our world literature class. Your syllabi, as opposed to being a more specialized sort of study, you should be studied along other Renaissance writers. It's really important to have a man such as Montaigne's work to be preserved because he really represents a view of the French Renaissance that we hardly get to see, which can be either, you know, a Catholic extreme or a Protestant extreme. And Montaigne is actually a really good blend of both since he's so tolerant. It's also incredible simply because they're very good life lessons. I mean, even if you don't necessarily need to know how children should be instructed, as one of his essays details, it's still very interesting to learn about his viewpoint on the matter, or even for a good laugh. Like, I think that the power of the imagination is actually really funny once you get down to what he's actually talking about. It's also important that academics and students see where the essay form comes from and how it was that it came to be and why it is that it's still around today because it's incredibly useful as a tool for documenting our thoughts and ideas. And as we've seen, it's evolved into articles and personal nonfiction and so on and so forth. It's a very versatile tool. And I believe Montaigne is to be given credit for that. And that's my presentation from Michel de Montaigne. I hope you learned something about him, and I hope that you also pick up some of his essays. You don't necessarily have to get it in the giant form like this, but plenty of them are available online, and I would strongly suggest checking out a few. Thank you, and have a great spring break.